Number 16, Jarvis Tillman and Amanda Halsey. 24-year-old Aliko Dennis was last seen in Macon, Georgia on May 16, 2023. That day, he was in the area for a work assignment. Nearly two days later, his body was discovered dead in a local apartment building with multiple gunshot wounds. Investigators believe he was killed the night he disappeared. 38-year-old Jarvis Jermaine Tillman and 30-year-old Amanda Allen Halsey were later charged with murder, tampering with evidence, concealing a death, as well as aggravated assault. Tillman faces an additional charge for violating probation for a former incident. The couple's alleged motive and the details surrounding the case are still largely unclear. According to local news station 13 WMAZ, Amanda Halsey was cleared of another violent crime a few months before Aliko's death. In early 2022, she and her boyfriend at the time, Tyrek Dixon, were charged with murder in connection to another suspicious death. The charges against Halsey were eventually dropped, though, and the case proceeded solely against Dixon. In yet another unrelated case in 2021, Halsey pleaded guilty to aggravated assault and terroristic threats. She also previously faced drug charges and charges in connection with her alleged participation in a prostitution ring. Although nothing has been confirmed in Oliko Dennis's case, based on the history of both suspects, it seems the killer may have been found. We'll have to wait and see how the case develops for confirmation, though. Number 15. Corey Richens After suddenly becoming widowed, Corey Richens, a mother of three and real estate agent from Utah, wrote a book to help her three sons process her husband Eric's death. The book was published in early 2023 and received widespread media coverage as the investigation into Eric's death played out. The seemingly unexpected tragedy happened on the night of March 3, 2022, while the couple celebrated Corey selling a house. She later told police that she made Eric a Moscow mule, which he decided to drink in bed. They then fell asleep, with Corey in her child's bedroom trying to comfort him from a nightmare, and Eric in their room. Corey awoke several hours later and discovered that Eric was cold to the touch. She called 911 and emergency responders declared Eric dead at the scene. At least, that's the story Corey told everyone. During the investigation, detectives discovered that she had lied about not using her phone after she woke up and discovered Eric's body. According to law enforcement, phone records revealed that she had actually sent and received multiple text messages during that time, which she later deleted. A toxicology report indicated that Eric had five times the lethal dose of fentanyl in his system at the time of his death, and in May 2023, authorities officially charged Corey with his murder. The medical examiner concluded that he had ingested the drug orally, indicating that it was probably slipped into his drink. An acquaintance of Corey's, identified only as CL in court documents, reportedly told police that the woman had reached out to him in search of narcotic painkillers in the weeks leading up to her husband's death. He allegedly admitted to selling her 30 fentanyl pills for about $800. Corey was also charged with intent to distribute for having a large quantity of the drug GHB on her. Investigators also learned that Eric had gotten sick after eating Valentine's Day dinner with Corey not long before his death. It happened three days after she bought the fentanyl and six days before he was killed. He told friends that he suspected his wife tried to poison him. She soon reached out to a dealer for another batch of the drugs, leading to the suspicion that she either tried and failed to kill Eric during the first incident, or was perhaps doing a dry run to see how the drugs affected him and gauge what a lethal dose for him would be. According to Eric's family, Corey had a financial motive for killing her husband. They claimed that she started to experience serious financial problems in 2016 and was stealing money from Eric to fund her business endeavors. By the time Eric discovered the missing money, Corey had allegedly already drained his bank account, taken out loans, and racked up credit card debts of about $380,000. Corey Richens is currently behind bars without bail as she awaits trial. According to the most recent updates on the case, the prosecutors have sought a gag order to stop those involved with the case from speaking with the media. Number 14. Steve Milner 56-year-old Kenneth Fandrich's wife, Tanya, first reported him missing in January 2023 when he stopped answering her calls and messages. 
Based on his cell phone location, she directed the police to a parking garage in Hillsborough, Oregon, where officers found him murdered in his car. Someone had bludgeoned him so hard that the man's spine was severed. Kenneth was in the parking garage because he was working in an area nearby as a pipe fitter. Shortly before the murder, someone went inside the garage dressed in construction gear and spray-painted the lenses on multiple security cameras. Despite this, a maroon minivan was still seen pulling up to Kenneth's car and leaving about a half hour later. Detectives were able to pull a male's DNA sample from the victim's hands. For years leading up to his murder, Kenneth was convinced that a local veterinarian named Steve Milner had it out for him. It all started when Tanya Fandridge worked for Milner. They had a brief five-month affair in 2017 before Tanya and Kenneth decided to work on their marriage and stay together. According to Tanya, the stalking started right after she ended her fling with Milner. The last contact she had with him happened a few years earlier when Milner bailed her out of jail after a domestic dispute. He had somehow found out about Tanya's arrest and randomly showed up at the jail to bail her out. In 2021, the year before his death, Kenneth filed a civil lawsuit accusing Milner of stalking, including planting a GPS device on his vehicle, following him, making death threats, and doing other concerning things. The Fandridges had reported Milner to the police numerous times before, including after they caught him installing a GPS on Kenneth's truck. But law enforcement allegedly brushed off the concerns, no matter how extreme the allegations became. It's common for police to not take stalking complaints seriously in America, so this wasn't all too surprising. Even after Kenneth caught Milner trespassing on his property and installing yet another tracking device, which law enforcement had to call in a bomb squad to remove, authorities declined to arrest the wayward animal doctor. It didn't help that Milner was extremely well-liked in the small town community where he was known for being an exceptionally skilled and kind vet. He was so beloved that even the Fandrich's friends had trouble believing their wild claims. But the signs were all there, especially after the couple installed security cameras at their house and captured footage of Milner's unwelcome presence. About nine months before Kenneth's murder, Milner was pulled over for following him. He told the officer that he was just worried about Tanya's safety because Kenneth beat her and he wanted to have a conversation about it since the police allegedly refused to take action. The officer warned Milner to knock it off and simply sent him on his way. After that incident, Kenneth told police that he was afraid Milner might cut him up into tiny pieces. Milner was eventually charged with violating the restraining order, but he managed to stay free while his case played out in court. He is now behind bars facing multiple charges in connection to Kenneth's death, including one count of second-degree murder, multiple counts of violating a restraining order, and stalking. It seems he couldn't get over Tanya and couldn't live with the thought of another man being with her. Number 13. Rashid Ali Bynum A 30-year-old New Jersey councilwoman named Eunice Cade Wumfor was the first African-American person elected to office in the town of Sayreville. She was serving her first term when she was fatally shot in her car one night in February 2022. The attack happened outside her apartment building, causing her to lose control of her vehicle and roll down the street before crashing into two parked cars. She was pronounced dead at the scene. During her short-lived career, Dwamfor earned a reputation for being competent, responsible, and dedicated to her community. Her murder came as both a shock and a disappointment to the people in her life who will never get to see how far she would have gone. She was also known for being a doting mother and for her devotion to faith. In other words, even though working in politics tends to make enemies, it was hard for anyone to understand why someone wanted Dwamfor dead. What made the crime even more unbelievable was the fact that the shooting happened in a typically safe area. Dumfor had just gone home from shopping when she was killed. The timing of the shooting only adds to the suspicion that she was being followed and targeted. Months passed without any arrests, causing many of Dumfor's friends, loved ones, and colleagues to wonder if justice would ever be served. Finally, in late May, authorities arrested a 28-year-old Virginia man named Rashid Ali Bynum on suspicion of first-degree murder. According to investigators, Dwamfor and Bynum knew each other through their church. 
Prosecutors have not disclosed a possible motive in the crime just yet, and Bynum has remained silent since his arrest. The case is still ongoing. Number 12. Matteo Messina Denaro During the 1990s, Italian authorities connected the notorious Cosa Nostra mobster Matteo Messina Denaro to dozens of high-profile murders, including the death of two of the country's top anti-mafia lawyers. He also allegedly played a key role in multiple deadly bombings in major cities, and even strangled a pregnant woman to death with his own hands. The homicides and acts of terror happened during a period of heightened violence as the Sicilian mob declared war against the Italian state. Messina Denaro went into hiding back in 1993. Meanwhile, he continued running the majority of Western Sicily's Trapani province from behind a curtain. He managed to keep such a low profile that investigators had little to no clues in their efforts to track him down. They didn't even have a recent photo of him and believed that he might have undergone plastic surgery to change his appearance. In 2001, Messina Denaro was sentenced in absentia to life in prison for his role in the bombings. Over the years, reports of suspected sightings of the man have poured in from all over Europe. In 2021, a man in the Netherlands spent days in custody after being mistaken for the fugitive. Authorities knew there had to be people who knew where Messina Denaro was, but they refused to give him up, even as they arrested his relatives and associates for other mafia-related crimes, they stayed tight-lipped about his whereabouts. Based on wiretapped phone conversations, they also knew Messina Denaro was suffering thanks to cancer in recent years. They hoped his need for a heightened level of care would somehow make it easier for them to find him. By tracking a list of patients who were undergoing the same type of treatment Messina Denaro needed, detectives eventually managed to narrow the list down to a few names they believed he may have been using as an alias. After identifying their top suspect, police waited at the hospital for a man going by Andrea Bonafedi to show up for treatment in January 2023. Sure enough, Messina Denaro came strolling up to the entrance nonchalantly. He immediately told them his real name when asked, causing police and civilians alike to erupt into cheers. After 30 years on the run, the missing mafioso was finally in custody. While law enforcement still has their work cut out for them when it comes to taking down the rest of the Mafia, this arrest represents a major defeat against the organization. Number 11. Blair Watts It was out of character for 43-year-old Jennifer Brown to not show up for her son, so when she failed to pick him up at his bus stop one day in 2023, her family knew something was wrong. Her friend and business partner, 33-year-old Blair Anthony Watts, had already reported her missing and was the last person who saw Jennifer alive. The family helped spread the word about the devoted single mother's disappearance in hopes that someone would eventually come forward with information. Jennifer Brown and Blair Watts had apparently made plans to open a restaurant together about five months before, but it never happened. On January 3rd, the day Jennifer vanished, someone transferred $17,000 from her bank account to Blair's. Police found Jennifer's car in her driveway with her keys, wallet, purse, and work phone still inside. Her personal cell phone was missing, though, and was later discovered in Blair's possession. Cadaver dogs reportedly detected traces of human remains inside vehicles driven by Blair, and Jennifer's body was later discovered in a shallow grave behind an industrial complex a few weeks after she went missing. The coroner declared that she was most likely strangled to death. Two months after Jennifer vanished, law enforcement charged Watts with first-degree murder. Prosecutors have accused him of reporting Jennifer missing to try and make himself seem innocent, but he pleaded not guilty. His lawyer, Benjamin Cooper, called the case circumstantial at best and said that they looked forward to proving their innocence in court. Cooper told the press that he plans to fight the charges on Blair's behalf and that he's considering filing a motion for a change of venue thanks to the widespread publicity the case is currently receiving in Montgomery County. Number 10. Dax Rodriguez 
A frantic woman barely escaped her homicidal ex-boyfriend one day in May 2023 and had to call 911 from a neighbor's house in Brevard County, Florida. Sheriff's deputies tried to pull 52-year-old Dax Rodriguez over in response to the call, but he instead led them on a high-speed chase. The pursuit ended with a pit maneuver, which is often used by police to force cars to stop. According to charging documents, Rodriguez broke into the victim's house, took her phone away, and threatened her at gunpoint after she tried to break up over text message. She grabbed the phone and ran for help, while Rodriguez chased her and grabbed her phone again. The woman managed to text another household member and warn them not to come back home because of the dangerous situation that was unfolding. She then managed to escape a second time, at which point Rodriguez fled the scene in a stolen car. In addition to threatening the victim, he also allegedly planned to kidnap and kill others, including the woman's brother, his ex-wife, Janet Rodriguez, and even his brother-in-law. At the time of the crash, he was reportedly on his way to kidnap his two children. Dax Rodriguez was quickly charged with a slew of crimes, including robbery with a firearm, grand theft auto, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, fleeing with disregard to the safety of persons or property, armed burglary, kidnapping, probation violation, fleeing law enforcement at high speed, criminal mischief, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, and more. Speaking with Click Orlando, Janet Rodriguez expressed her relief that her ex-husband was locked up behind bars and her gratitude toward the woman who got away from him and called for help. She described Rodriguez simply as pure, pure evil. Just days after landing in custody, he received even more charges for allegedly violating a restraining order and trying to contact his ex-girlfriend. The judge revoked his bond in response to this, citing his apparent inability to follow orders, and he remains behind bars while awaiting his next court date. Number 9. Alexander Isaac a 25-year-old Staten Island woman rushed into an NYPD precinct one night in March 2023. She told an intense story of how she had just narrowly escaped her allegedly abusive on-and-off-again boyfriend. The victim accused 30-year-old Alexander Isaac of assaulting her in the motorhome he was living in. According to her complaint, Isaac handcuffed her arms behind her back, gagged her with a t-shirt, and attacked her multiple times. He allegedly beat her, struck her legs with a belt, and committed other horrific acts before locking the home and leaving the woman inside for nine hours. She eventually managed to escape, but Isaac caught up with her a few blocks away from the police station and dragged her back to the motor home, where this time he handcuffed her to a bedpost. Luckily, the woman escaped again, this time, she made it all the way to the police station. Armed with a warrant, officers descended on Isaac's junk-covered property. They found a pipe bomb, suspicious chemicals, a 3D printer, and evidence of an attempt to make something called a ghost gun. Neighbors told the New York Daily News that the victim had sought shelter multiple times in the months leading up to the incident. One local resident even said that Isaac seemed like a nice guy when he first moved in on the lot two years earlier, but that people's opinions of him changed after they saw signs that he was beating his girlfriend. The manager of a nearby hotel said that he had let the woman stay overnight a few times, but that she always went back to her abuser. While the allegations were nothing new to him, the man was shocked to learn that police found a bomb on the property. Isaac now faces multiple charges, including kidnapping, unlawful imprisonment, and several counts stemming from the assault. Number 8. Raul Meza Jr. In May 2023, while performing a welfare check at an apartment complex in Pflugerville, Texas, police found 80-year-old Jesse Fraga dead inside a closet. He had a belt around his neck and a severed spine, and there were also knives and blood splattered throughout the residence. During the investigation, detectives found out that Fraga's roommate, 62-year-old Raul Meza Jr., had recently been seen driving the victim's truck. So they obtained a warrant for Meza's arrest and were shocked when they received a phone call from him. Meza introduced himself and acknowledged that he knew law enforcement was looking for him. He confessed to killing Fraga and described the nature of the crime in detail. The fugitive also implicated himself in the 2019 murder of 66-year-old Gloria Lofton and gave details about the crime that were never released to the public. 
During the call, Mazer said that he planned to kill again and was looking forward to it. A four-day manhunt then ensued before he was eventually taken into custody on charges of capital murder, felony, unauthorized use of a vehicle, and two first-degree felonies that authorities declined to name. When he was captured, police found duct tape, ammunition, and zip ties in his possession. In the meantime, detectives have identified at least eight other cold cases that they suspect Mazer was involved in. He has a lengthy rap sheet dating back almost 50 years, starting with an aggravated robbery in 1975. Mesa served five years of a 20-year sentence for this. He was still on parole in 1982 when he was convicted of murdering a girl named Kendra Page. The court imposed a 30-year sentence, but he was released after just 11 years thanks to good behavior. Over the next few decades, Mesa was in and out of prison for other crimes, including violating his parole on a murder case. He finally regained his freedom in 2016 and moved in next door to Gloria Lofton, who he killed three years later. Authorities say they're not sure how many lives Mazer has taken. It's something they're trying to figure out as the investigation continues. For now, he's behind bars on a $1 million bond. It's entirely possible that Mazer could pass away from old age before the case goes to trial. Number 7. Chloe Stein before her graduation from Penn State in May 2023, 23-year-old Chloe Stein vanished without a trace during her drive home from work one day. The last known communication with anyone in her life was a text message she sent her boyfriend late at night, saying that she was supposedly being pulled over by a police officer. Chloe's boyfriend tried repeatedly to get a hold of her after this with no success. Meanwhile, the missing woman's family found her car abandoned along a road. They reported Chloe missing and a large manhunt ensued. After spending thousands of dollars on the search, state police received a tip claiming that Chloe was alive at a home in Jeanette, about 30 miles outside Pittsburgh. Sure enough, troopers paid a visit to the home and found her there. During questioning, Chloe allegedly claimed that she was kidnapped at gunpoint by a man pretending to be a cop. She said she was blindfolded and taken to multiple locations before being dropped off in an alleyway. By then, investigators already realized the truth about the situation. They had learned from officials at Penn State that Chloe was not actually enrolled as a student there. In fact, she hadn't been for a long time, but nobody in her life seemed to realize this. It made police wonder if Chloe had lied to her boyfriend about being pulled over and staged her own kidnapping to avoid having people find out that she had dropped out of college. When confronted about inconsistencies in her story and the evidence, she allegedly admitted to lying. She also admitted that she knew the text she sent to her boyfriend and her radio silence would cause alarm, according to state trooper Steve Lamani. In addition to mentioning the amount of taxpayer dollars that were needlessly spent on the search, he condemned her actions for the widespread fear they generated throughout the community, who were left to wonder if there was a kidnapper on the loose. Chloe was charged with four misdemeanors, including false alarm to a public safety agency, falsely reporting an offense that did not happen, obstructing administration of law, and disorderly conduct. Number 6. Tabo Besta An infamous South African con artist named Tabo Besta was serving a 75-year sentence for murdering and viciously assaulting women when human remains were discovered in his prison cell back in May 2022. Investigators believed the remains belonged to Besta. After all, they had no reason not to. It wasn't until almost a year later that a second investigation found that the remains were not actually Besta's after all. This came after law enforcement received reports claiming that Bester was still alive and well in Johannesburg. They also got information from multiple women who said that the convict had contacted them on social media. Detectives have theorized that several accomplices worked together to pull off a complex escape plan. Someone even claimed a body from a local hospital and smuggled it into Bester's prison inside a TV cabinet. The decoy body was then burned and left in the cell, while Bester escaped wearing a warden's uniform. DNA tests confirmed that the charred remains belonged to another missing convict, who disappeared around the same time the body was found. 
police dug up the grave and found sacks of corn inside the casket instead of a corpse. They also found records detailing the movement of the car that transported the body. In addition to having a lot of help, officials believe Besta managed to get away with the elaborate plan by bribing a technician to disconnect surveillance cameras inside the prison. Knowing they were about a year behind on finding the fugitive, authorities issued several notices for the public to be on the lookout and offered a large monetary reward for helpful information. Considering the horrific circumstances of Bester's crimes, the community was outraged to learn that he'd been at large for over a year. Shortly after the notice for his capture was put out, he was arrested in Tanzania with his surprising partner, celebrity doctor Nandipa Magudamana. He had an American passport with him under the name Tom Williams Kelly. Bester was never officially documented as a South African citizen, despite being born there. As a result, he had no South African documentation on him when he was taken into police custody. Seven alleged co-conspirators have also been arrested in connection to the bizarre plot. All of the cases are ongoing. Number 5. Madison Russo when a 19-year-old woman from Iowa named Madison Russo made a crowdfunding page describing a heartbreaking battle against two types of cancer, the donations quickly flooded in. She claimed she was suffering from pancreatic cancer and acute lymphoblastic leukemia, along with a football-sized tumor that was supposedly wrapped around her spine. Her campaign received over $37,000 from over 400 separate donors. According to police, Russo never had cancer at all and was faking it the entire time. She's been accused of taking her elaborate scheme far enough to give speeches at a college and even a pancreatic nonprofit. Her story truly passed as genuine for a while. But medical experts noticed some discrepancies which led them to suspect Russo was a fraud. They contacted authorities and an investigation was launched. In addition to the medical inconsistencies, detectives also noticed that Russo seemed to be in surprisingly good health for someone who was suffering from cancer. She had a 4.0 GPA in college, worked part-time and even went golfing during her free time. During a search of Russo's apartment, police found an IV pole and other medical equipment, a wig, receipts, a vehicle, and other items. They realized that some of the photos on Russo's fundraising and social media pages seemed to be taken at her apartment instead of a medical office. She's also been accused of stealing some of her photos from the pages of people who were legitimately suffering from diseases. Medical records from area hospitals show no history of Russo ever being treated for cancer. The crowdfunding site issued a full refund to all donors, and Russo was charged with one felony count of first-degree theft. If convicted, she could face up to 10 years in prison. Her next court date is scheduled for September 2023. Number 4. Nasir Grant and Amin Hurst 24-year-old Nasir Grant and 18-year-old Amin Hurst managed to escape from a Philadelphia jail one night in May 2023 by cutting a hole through a perimeter fence. Corrections officers somehow didn't notice their absence throughout the next three headcounts. When staff members finally realized they were missing, 19 hours after they escaped, a massive 10-day manhunt broke out. Officials blamed the failure to notice the missing inmates on a staff shortage and other multiple system failures. David Robinson, who heads the Correction Officers Union, told the Philadelphia Inquirer that the unit Grant and Hearst escaped from was basically unstaffed at the time of the breakout. Grant was behind bars for theft, gun and drug charges. Hearst was being held on suspicion of four shooting deaths that were carried out over a three-month period at the end of 2020. After four days on the run, Grant was finally taken into custody in northern Philadelphia. He was spotted leaving a home in full female Muslim garb and a head covering and getting into a car. They pulled the vehicle over and he was taken into custody without incident. Supervisory Deputy U.S. Marshal Robert Clark said that Grant genuinely seemed surprised he was caught. Around the same time, authorities arrested a 21-year-old woman named Jani Stallings on suspicion of helping one of the men escape. Based on recorded jailhouse phone calls, they believe she may have coordinated a getaway vehicle from the jail for Hearst. Stallings was later charged with conspiracy and hindering apprehension. 
Hearst was captured in Western Philadelphia a few days later, bringing the manhunt to a close. A relative tried to negotiate his surrender, but failed to get him to turn himself in. He was found after being spotted by surveillance in the areas police believed he might be hiding out in. Grant and Hearst were each charged with one count of escape. A prisoner who's accused of acting as a lookout and a civilian who allegedly conspired with Hearst after his escape are also facing charges for the incident. Number 3. Lost in Lee At the start of June 2023, 34-year-old single mother Keisha Cherry Gray became the eighth New Orleans woman to be killed over a six-week period. She was gunned down at her home right in front of her small children. The father of two of her younger kids, 34-year-old Lostin Lee, called 911 and reported the incident. Officers arrived at the scene and found Keisha dead on the floor in a pool of blood with a gunshot wound to the cheek. There were two knives beneath her legs. According to police documents, Lee said he was visiting his mom when Keisha called him and said she wanted him to move out of their home because she thought he was cheating on her. Lee claimed Keisha was packing his belongings up when he got home and that she was not in the mood for a rational conversation. He accused her of pulling a kitchen knife on him and threatening him when he tried to talk to her. Fearing for his life, Lee shot Keisha. Instead of calling the police right then and there, he met up with some relatives at a restaurant to discuss the situation. Police confirmed that they had no prior domestic incidents involving Lee on their records and no recent calls to his address for help. Keisha's aunt, Veronica Speed, told NOLA.com that the family thinks Lee murdered Keisha because she refused to stay with him after his infidelity. Authorities did not buy Lee's self-defense claim at all. He currently faces a second-degree murder charge and is being held on $500,000 bail. Number 2. Montrell Burley Known by his stage name BTB Savage, a 26-year-old aspiring rapper named Daryl Gentry was fatally shot in a Houston drive-by in March 2023. Witnesses reported seeing a dark Saturn pull up right next to Gentry's Mercedes-Benz around 6 p.m. the night of the incident. Two suspects got out of the Subaru and opened fire, filling the Benz with dozens of bullet holes. Gentry's mother, Benita Ward, told local news station KHOU that she believes the shooting stemmed from a previous incident where a former friend of her son's tried to rob him and his fiance in San Antonio. The couple managed to overpower the thief and shot one of them in self-defense. After determining that the shooting was completely justified, authorities decided not to press charges. Ward said the incident increased the pressure on the streets for people to retaliate against Gentry, though. In a chilling last conversation with his mom, he predicted his own death. He was having what seemed like a normal discussion with Ward on the phone while sending her a text saying that he believed he was getting set up. At the time, Gentry was on his way to the airport to visit his family. Sadly, he never made it. The senseless killing has devastated Gentry's family as they await answers about what really led up to the shooting. 40-year-old Montrell Leonard Burley turned himself in 11 days after the crime when he learned he was identified as a suspect. According to court documents, Burley rented a dark Subaru SUV shortly before the crime. Phone records and evidence from inside the car also put Burley at the crime scene, according to investigators. One suspect still remains at large. Police are hoping someone comes forward and helps identify them soon. Number 1. Dean Colin Godfrey a former assistant district attorney from Wichita Falls, Kansas, had been in and out of jail so many times over a month-long period that it quickly became difficult to keep track. It all started when 34-year-old Dean Colin Godfrey was arrested in May 2023 in connection to an alleged trespassing incident. He posted bail for this, but was taken back into custody the next day for a stalking charge. According to reports, Godfrey is accused of harassing his girlfriend and showing up at both her home and workplace after being ordered not to do so. He was kicked out of her workplace after repeatedly making scenes, according to the victim. 
She also described a close call where she thought Godfrey was going to hit her car. In her petition to get a restraining order, the woman claimed that Godfrey posted flyers about her onto buildings while his ankle monitoring bracelet had a dead battery. The flyers reportedly featured photos of her, screenshots of their social media conversations, and multiple captions including one stating, who is stalking who? Some of the flyers accused a woman of violating the protective order she got against Godfrey, while another showed a photo of her climbing over a fence, supposedly as evidence that she was the actual guilty party in the situation. At the time, the victim was unable to access her email account, leading to the suspicion that Godfrey somehow hacked it to fabricate fake conversations. He's also accused of conveniently ignoring multiple attempts by authorities to get into contact with him and replace his ankle monitor battery. A few weeks after the first two arrests, Godfrey was booked on even more charges and once again taken into custody. This time he was charged with two felony counts of repeatedly violating court orders, one felony count of stalking and one misdemeanor count of criminal trespass. In a jailhouse phone call he had with his mother, he allegedly pulled the victim card and complained about being behind bars. His mother replied, simply saying, you made more bad decisions. Godfrey also expressed his amusement about the flyers prosecutors are accusing him of hanging up around town. He bonded out for $35,000 and is currently free pending the outcome of the case. Have you ever known someone who felt proud about committing a crime, even when they got arrested for it? Let us know in the comments below, but be sure to subscribe first. Thanks for watching. If you had to serve a six month prison sentence, would you rather share a cell with a calm serial killer or a short tempered petty criminal who always picks fights? Let us know in the comments below.